Radio Richard. I'm really happy to be here with my old friend, Steve Rowland, who is a producer, actor, photo micrographer, balloonist, racing driver, and Uncle Tom Cobbley. So hi, Steve. How are you? <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Richard Niles, you have the best sense of humor of anybody I know, especially when you were leading a band in London with a carrot. Well, and a leek, too. I used a variety of root vegetables, too. <laughs> uh, you've had an incredible career, and there's way too much to talk about in this. I know this will only be the first of many sessions uh, that we'll have like this, but I want to get started uh, with the very beginnings of your of your life, uh, you grew up literally with uh, superstar Hollywood parents, and you got right into being a young actor in the glory days of Hollywood in the 50s. And, you know, everybody fantasizes about that, but you were there. You made it sound so easy. <laughs> no, it wasn't easy, I'm sure. And, and, At all. And especially for someone like you. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, my father was a director by the name of Roy Rowland, 42 films later, and my mother was Ruth Cummings. She was a, a writer and a script writer. And unfortunately, I hate to even admit it, my distant uncle was L.B. Mayer. Indeed. Well, you know, some people would find that slightly strange that you would say, I hate to admit it. Wow, how wonderful to have your uncle. Well, there's a reason there. for that, Richard. He was a, uh, he was a despot. And uh, he was the kind of guy that had power, a lot of power. And if he didn't like somebody or someone said something wrong or somebody didn't do what he said, he would cancel them. You know, right. like today, cancel. One day, or one evening, I should say, my, uh, I, my family was invited up to his house in Bel Air for dinner. And there was a grouping of all, of all the family. And I had just graduated from high school. And my uh, father had told me before I graduated, if I got good grades, that he would buy me a Corvette. So uh, during the dinner, dinner time, uh, LB was talking to me about what do you do, Steve? What do you want to do? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, but I'll tell you this. I said, my dad bought me a Corvette. And LB jammed his, fuss, his fist down on the table and he said, I would never have, have, have done that. And so I, I said to him, well, thank God you're not my father. Nice. And my mother froze in her seat. And my father kind of chuckled, but that was the kind of guy he was. <clears throat> well, now, but Louis B. was not really happy that his niece was your mother, number one, yes? Yes. Uh, and he wasn't super happy about her marrying your dad. Now, the reason for that years. was because my dad was came from Hell's Kitchen, New York. He, they had a very poor family. In fact, my dad, when he was a little kid, was a bag man for the mob. In other words, he collected the, the uh, change or whatever from the slot machines and the jukeboxes and paid it to the mob. And then he got paid and that money went to the family. While, and and it, my uncle didn't approve. And uh, he was, he was not the kind of guy that you could sit down and discuss something with. So he was, he had it in for my dad. And uh, I, I really, seeing as I wasn't there, <laughs> I really can't tell you all the reasons, but that was the main reason that he, that he didn't. She, she married outside of wealth is what the reason was. And it was also, the fact that my mother, I think maybe I got it from her, she would stand up against any adversary. She didn't care. And she would tell, and, and so she said to my father, Roy, 
Forget that. Forget LB. We don't need his approval. And they eloped, got married. And then later on, when my uncle met my father and found that he really liked him, they went and got married properly. But my mother is a very, was a very, very tough woman. And uh, she was, very, I used to say, mom, wow, you're so proper. How could you be that proper? That's the way she was. Yeah. Well, she was a great woman. I remember her well. And I remember that every time I would come to the house and see them, your dog would go absolutely apeshit crazy. Well, you know why. Yeah. And then, and, and she'd say to you, and you, of course, you'd make the dog panda run around in circles and take a piss on the floor. But, but she, and, and she'd say, Steve, don't wind the dog up. Don't, don't, don't. But you'd keep doing it, of course. Uh, do you know, you know the story, Richard, about, about the women coming to visit my mother on a Thursday and how I just couldn't stand them? And so I, shall I tell that story? I don't know whether. Yeah, go ahead. Why not? <laughs> well, the the um, these women would they have a, a like a coffee clutch every Thursday. All the, the the friends of my mother who were, I guess, the wives and relatives of the big industry producers. She felt that by doing that, it was help my father. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Anyway, I hated them because they would come in and they would always go, oh, oh, Stevie, oh, you are so cheap. They tap you on the head. Yeah. So I decided that I was going to fix them. <laughs> now upstairs was my mother and father's bedroom. It overlooked the main walk up to the front door of my house. <laughs> and I, this particular day when they came, we had dormer windows, no air conditioning. So you would open the window and there was a screen that would keep the bugs out. And the screen, because they were sash windows, there was about an eighth of an inch underneath our 16th of an inch between the bottom of the, of the screen and the sill. So I decided I was going to pee on them. So when they walked up the path on this particular Thursday, I stood up on my tiptoes and I peed into the well where the, where the window comes down. The water ran out underneath. <laughs> then it slowly went down the fruit. <laughs> it dropped on the woman one of the women absolutely perfectly <laughs> and when she rang she was wiping her you know, going on <clears> this and when she came in the house she said oh, 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 there's some wet came out and so I'm going to stay there <laughs> yelled because she knew exactly what I had done but the kicker was she said I'm going to tell your father exactly what you've done <laughs> So she, when her father came home, she said, Roy, I want you to talk to Steve. He did a terrible thing. So my <laughs> father calls me into the, into the den and he says to me, your mother tells me that you poured water. He, they didn't know I peed. Mm. That you poured water on the women coming up. Is that true? I said, yeah, it was more than that, Dad. And he started, he said, well, you know, I'm going to have to rip. <laughs> he died laughing because he couldn't stand them either. <laughs> right. and, and, and of course, this wasn't when you were in your 30s. This you were, you were. A, I was 12, 13, something. 12 or 13, yeah. So in, in your. Not when I was in my 30s. <laughs> <laughs> And, that, thing. <laughs> and I just want to tell my listeners in Radio Richard Lamb that that is what Hollywood was like growing up in the 40s in in uh, in America in uh, in the yes Definitely. and so so look let, let's let's move on a little bit and speaking of the women who came to visit your mother um, I guess this leads me on to a very nice uh, story about how you became a uh, Hollywood gossip columnist. And uh, it had to do with one of your mother's friends, didn't it? Yes, it did. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a gift. It was because I knew everybody. You know, we had our own rat pack, so to speak, in those days. All the young guys, Dennis Hopper, and, and uh, we were all like a rat pack together. 
And uh, this Elise Canfield was the name of this woman. And she was an editor for a couple of fan magazines in New York. And she was a very good friend of my mother's. And one day she was at the house and uh, I came in and I said, oh, I, I'm going to I'm going to go see so and so and so and so. And uh, Elise Canfield said, oh, Steve, I, huh, sounds like you know a lot of people. And I said, yeah, I know everybody in, in Hollywood. We all run around and we get into trouble and so and so. And she said, well, how would you like to write a, fan, a, a column in our fan magazines? And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you know everybody. You can write about them, you know? And I said, yeah. I said, sure. So I had been struggling trying to become an actor. This wasn't when I was 12 or 13, by the way. This was when no, I was 18. This is, this is when you were just starting to become starting an actor. Starting out. Anyway, yeah. And so to supplement my income, because I wasn't getting acting roles, I decided <clears> to do that. I think, I think she paid me $75 a column, something like that. Nice. And That's I wrote a lot of money in those. And, and, and as you say, and in the book, uh, the in the back are black pages, and those are direct pages from those uh, uh, fan magazines. Right. Yeah. So and you, know, you knew guys like Robert Wagner and Clinton. I knew. Uh, yeah, and, I knew all, all those guys. guys. Yeah. Just name some of the clubs that you used to go to with these people. <laughs> well, I can tell you one club. Everybody asks me why uh, why I have this ring. Okay. Show you. Yeah, the reason you. I have that ring is because I was a very, very, very big fan of B.B. King. And I used to go down to the 5-4 ballroom on Central Avenue in, East, in L.A. and uh, watch him and many other great artists when I could. And B.B. King had a big uh, signature ring on his left hand on his first finger on his left hand and I thought right I'm going to get one and that's why I've had this ring yeah. since I was show it to the audience up. again a little bit again closer uh, a little bit up higher and to and to the right that's it perfect okay there it is fans the ring and I've had it till this day <clears throat> yeah anyway that's that's uh, the clubs um there was zeros of course of course there were clubs like you know there are in, in england you know where you go in and dance there were clubs like cyrano's macombo trocadero you know those kind of places Harold and, carols and just to give a, an impression of what it was actually like i mean there were sit down uh, booths the people sat down tables and booths uh for dinner yes um uh, for instance Ciro's was a club where they would have, they called it a club, but it's not a club like you think. It was a restaurant where you dined and they had the white tablecloths and all that, maitre d's and waiters with, with white towels over their arms and all that. Yeah. And they also had a stage and it was a big stage and they would have an act. Yeah, uh, and, and, and a dance floor, right? And a dance floor. That's yeah. exactly right. It, right. And it, those, that's what they consider clubs. And, uh, and when you, know, you get to something like that, tell me just what you'd be wearing, because people don't don't have this kind of feeling uh, or understanding that what it was like to have to dress for dinner or dress to go to one of those clubs. Well, they wouldn't let you in unless you had a, a, a shirt and jacket on. You couldn't go in, for instance, in, in a T-shirt and jeans. You'd have to be dressed. And for the older people, uh, you'd have to have a tie. And if you didn't have a tie, they would give you one to put on. Right, right. You were very into racing. Tell us about your racing time. Well, funnily enough, the person who got me involved in racing was Jimmy Dean. And uh, obviously, all of us idolized him. And he would be going to these various uh, sports car races in Palm Springs and around the area like that and uh i got to know him and uh, i got to be kind of friends with him not close friends but you know i would say close acquaintance with him and uh he invited me to go to uh up in santa barbara uh on the final race and uh i went along and uh he was very angry because his car he blew a cylinder 
and uh, he, he couldn't compete. When you've told me about uh, hanging out with Jimmy Dean before, you said that one of the things that uh, impressed you about him was that when you did have chats with him at the track, he was very thoughtful and very and a rather deep kind of quiet, he was a, a soft-spoken kind of guy. He was very focused on what he was doing. That's why he was such a great actor because he was focused. You know, they they use the word focus today on everything. But if you're going to be an actor, or in, as they say, and I know to be true, you don't act, you react. And in order to react, you have to listen and think about what the person is saying that is talking to you in a scene. And he was excellent at that. He was excellent at focusing on his racing. He was an excellent, excellent race driver. Motor, he had uh, motor, motorbike, motorcycles. He had uh, two Porsches. Um, he was excellent. I mean, for that matter, so was Steve McQueen. But right. Jimmy didn't live long enough to uh, go to any further great heights than he had when he finished Giant. But uh, he he talked to me. It wasn't at the racetrack. He talked to me on the set at uh, Warner Brothers when they were doing Giant. I asked him about acting, which I shouldn't have done. He didn't like to talk about that. But he, I said, you make it look so natural and so easy. Of course, in those days, anything like that was like something brand new. Nobody acted like that. Nobody was on the screen like that, except possibly Marlon Brando and maybe uh, Montgomery Cliff. But he said, what did you ever do, Steve? What did you ever do that you had to uh, really concentrate on? And I said, well, I did very well uh, as a diver in, in high school. I said, you know, I won a lot of diving championships. And he said, well, acting? is like diving. You're either good at it or you're not. And that was that was the conversation. And I never forgot it. Yeah. I made a couple of words are wrong, but that's what, what made, yeah what made you what made you a successful diver would also be the same. I had to concentrate. Yeah. There have been a lot of people who have talked about the fact that um, acting or music have to have similar disciplines uh, to each other because in music you have to practice a lot and well, in, actually, in acting you have to practice a lot. Uh, I was just listening to a very nice interview with Bill Nighy where he said that uh, he said they said well you you are so uh, well uh, respected as an actor and you have a reputation for being word perfect on set and memorizing the whole script. And Bill Nye said, it's very simple. I just say each line over and over again 19 times, and then I'm fine. And and he said, there's nothing to it. I just go out there and I act and then I have dinner. And I love that because it, it's kind of that. It's the preparation. And you, um, have, you have to become the character you are playing. You know, you really have to. You have to think like him. You have to move like him. You have to do all of that. The best person I ever knew that was so good with props and things was Steve McQueen. Right. He could do anything. Even when I worked with him, he, you know, anything, he would be moving and doing stuff and it was so natural. But yeah. remember, Richard, remember, this didn't start until Marlon Brando entered the scene. Right. When Marlon Brando entered the scene and then Jimmy Dean Yes. Acting change completely. Yeah. Yes. And and um, let's now just talk about some of your early acting experiences. Like uh, you can choose anything you like, but I, I know that you were one of your early roles uh, was in uh, the John Cassavetes film where you uh, oh. had a small part playing a juvenile delinquent. And you said that. I always had to play juvenile delinquents. <laughs> That was Crime in the Streets. Yes, that's right. And Don Siegel was a director. He was a great director. But it wasn't, you know, let me just, let me just, as Jen Saki would say, let me circle back. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was not easy for me to become an actor. First of all, I wasn't six feet tall. That's number one. Second of all, 
I wasn't Mr. Handsome. Um, my father didn't like the idea of me becoming an actor for an obvious reason. 99% of all actors in Hollywood, especially in those days, were out of work. There was no television to speak of. And uh, you didn't make much money uh, doing stage plays. And everybody, there'd be hundreds of people for the same part. And my father said, I could help you, Steve, but like I did, you're going to have to go out and prove to me that you can do this, that you're not thinking of it as just something that would be fun to do. If you start working, you get some breaks, and I can see that you're serious, I will help you. But whatever you do, whatever you do, don't get involved with anybody from the mob. And I said, sure, okay, fine. So I was writing the columns and, and I was getting a few bit parts and lots and lots of walk-on stuff and things like that. And uh, I did meet some people, shall we say, I will leave them nameless, that helped me. And uh, my father didn't know this. He thought I just got the parts by my own talent. Anyway, that's how I started. And I, I happened to get a part in a film with Chuck Connors, not a film, a television series called uh, The Rifleman. And it was a very good part, turned out very well. And that opened the door for me. And from there, I did uh, 49 television shows, had a running part in The Legend of Wyatt Earp, and did nine films. And then I decided I'd rather be behind the camera. I'd rather be a writer, producer, because being an actor, um, it's very precarious, absolutely precarious. So to answer your question, can you repeat it, please? Well, I don't remember it, but the answer was far more interesting than the question. As well, it was, it was interesting because and I know <laughs> you're going to get to this at some point. What about the girls? Well, all the girls that I met, I thought they all loved me. because They certainly acted like it. But what they really wanted was a connection with my father or my uncle, Jack Cummings. And there's one particular story, which I will not tell because it's a little bit uh, close to the knuckle, shall we say. Um, it's all in the book. Yeah, all, it's all in the book. Yeah. But these girls will do anything. And that brings me to Marilyn Monroe. Don't kid yourself. Marilyn Monroe was a very good actress when she wasn't uh, psychotic. She was an excellent actress. She went to the actor's studio. Uh, if you saw the Mit Misfits with Clark Gable, she was sensational in that. She was a natural comedian and she could sing. She was excellent. And she was a, really a nice lady. And uh, I thought the world of her, I thought, wow, if I can get a date with her, because I was trying to date everybody I could because I had this pass, passport, and the passport was, I had a very, very, or I had more than one very popular column in the, in the fan magazines, and I would write up about these various people, and uh, a lot of them would get breaks, and they would be spoken about, and uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll find out if I can get a date with Marilyn Monroe. And actually, I almost did. And that story's in the book. Well, I was very ill. And uh, in those days, when you got strep throat, the first thing you do is you'd go to your doctor and get a shot of penicillin. And on this particular uh, day, uh, I'd had a real bout of the flu. And uh, the doctor, Dr. Machin, was a family friend. And he was the doctor that, that the whole family and me used. So I called and uh, the night before, and he said, come to the office tomorrow morning, come early before anybody gets there and I'll see to you. So I did. And I was really sick when I went to the office. And when I got to the office, sitting in the same waiting room, was this blonde girl with big boobs and looking very ragged. 
It had been raining and her, 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 she was wearing a pair of cowboy boots, suede ones or, or rough out boots, and they were wet, stained. And she had a, a slicker on, kind of a slicker jacket. And uh, that was rain soaked as well. And I was sneezing and I was looking at her. She had great boobs and I was going to, you know, chat her up. So you speak. did mention that before, but that's all. Okay. Give, give her a pitch. <laughs> So we got to talking and I won't go into all the details. Anyway, the doctor opened the door. And he said, Steve, I'm ready to see you. Come on in. And I, before I went in, I said, listen, uh, uh, could, I, I saw something very, I don't know, she just reminded me of somebody. And I, I said to her, listen, uh, I'll be out of here. And maybe when you're out, maybe we can go up and, and, and get a coffee at one of the places. And she said, well, I don't know, but uh, ask me later. So I went in, had the shot of penicillin, came out. But while I was in there, I asked the doctor, I said, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, there's a great looking chick sitting out there. She looks familiar. Who is that? And he started laughing. He said, you don't know who that is? I said, no. He said, that's Marilyn Monroe. I almost died. I almost <laughs> fell on the floor. But when I went out there, she'd gone. In the story. Yeah. That was my encounter. Although I must say, it's interesting that even though you were so sick, you still had the energy to try to pick up a girl. I think that's... Absolutely. That's I mean, when you're young, you do anything, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, this period that you were in Hollywood, you were also involved with music and, and involved rather heavily. You had a band that was, that was playing in clubs. Uh, and uh, you also kind of hung out with uh, some really great musicians. Uh, one of them, Sam Cooke, who you said you were extremely uh, close with. Well, Sam Cooke was responsible for me getting into the, in the record business in the first place. I was trying to sing. Everybody was making records that had anything going. And uh, he and I became friendly. I met him through a fellow by the name of J.W. Alexander, who was a member of the Soul Stirrers, of which... Sam Cooke was one of the singers, along with J.W. Alexander, along with uh, right. Lou Rawls, right. who I also became friendly with. And I got, uh, Sam would come to the house and, and uh, I got to be friendly with him. I guess he thought it was funny that uh, some little white kid wanted to be a gospel singer. That's what I originally wanted to do. Yeah. And so he said, well, Steve, I'll tell you what, what you should do, and he gave me some ideas. And actually, I don't know whether anybody knows this. It probably sounds really phony, but it isn't. It's true. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll write a song for you. And the song he wrote, which I wasn't able to use because he kept it for himself, was right. She's Only 16. Oh, boy. Remember that? So yeah, sure. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he said, I'm sorry, Steve, but uh, I'm going to use that myself. And it was an excellent song. It was a big hit. But Sam was a great guy. We had a lot of fun together. And he was a big inspiration for me. And I went on to get into the music business years later because of him. And J.W. Alexander, who handled my affairs while I was starting out and taught me, you know, a little bit about what to do. You know, they have things today like The Voice and uh, America's Got Talent and such. Yeah. And... Uh, it was pretty much like what they're doing today, only in those days it was a lot harder because they didn't have so many outlets. Right, right. So well, you have to, in those days, Richard, I don't know whether you probably know this, you'd have to, in order to get to see anybody seriously, you'd have to make a demo. Sure. And you'd sure. go in, you'd hire a studio, and you'd go in <laughs> and you'd make a demo. There were no backing tracks, so you had yeah. to have a couple of musicians with you. Yes. And, uh, Jack Nietzsche was one of the fellows that played for me. And uh, it all started because there was a club in Beverly Hills called Ye Little Club that was like an English pub. And they used to have jazz acts in there um, three nights a week. And my friend Bud Albright and I would go in there and would sit and watch the jazz and try to pitch the birds. <laughs> and uh, this one night, uh, I said, maybe we can sing a song, but right? let's see. That way we're going to attract 
the girls. So we got up and we sang a rock and roll number and everybody went crazy because jazz is on one level and rock and roll is on another. And I suppose when people get drunk enough or drinking, they want to have a rousing time, you know? So the manager of that club was a fellow that was a little bit connected, if you know what I mean. And he saw the reaction. So he talked to both Bud and me about uh, him possibly managing something for us, which he did. And that's how the band started. Right. We put a band together. The fellow that was on tequila, Chuck Rio, joined our band. Right. And uh, later on, David Gates and Leon Russell joined our band. Fantastic. And we were quite successful. We played Fantastic. all over Hollywood, all over Los Angeles, in the clubs. We fought uh, off guys that were really pissed off because the, the girls liked it. I don't think they liked it so much about our singing. I think they liked it so much of the two young guys up there singing rock and roll numbers. Yes, exactly. So and not, and not wearing suits, you know. Yeah. And Jack Nietzsche was was uh, the keyboard player for your band. Is that right? Only in the very first. Then, then we got a couple of other people, and then later on we got Leah Russell. Right. But, right. Well, but uh, I don't think yeah, it was good. We played, yeah, we played parties and everything. It yeah. was a lot of fun and. Uh, I don't know whether you would say we were anything great. We were okay, let's put it that way. But all the girls would come to see us. We would pack the club out with girls. All the guys would come to chat up the girls. Right, exactly. Thus, they would buy drinks. Yeah. And so the club owners loved us because they were making money. Sure. And I can, should I tell you about our opening night, what happened? Go ahead. We were... We were <laughs> We were doing a gig at a place called the Encore on La Cienega Boulevard. It's no longer there. It's now a dress shop. And our manager had talked the owner of that club into hiring us to do one night a week. And the guy agreed. And uh, we set up this opening night. And the club really got started about 10 o'clock. So we, we rented all this equipment. You, you didn't carry equipment around in those days. Not at least we didn't. We rented the equipment and there were three of us. Guitar player, Bud and me, and uh, drummer. Uh, yeah, four people. That makes four. Four, and, yes. Yeah. I wasn't counting by, I guess. <laughs> and so we, we told the owner of the club that we would we were inviting everybody in Hollywood to come, that we were very popular, that uh, we knew everybody, we were actors, and we knew the whole inside guys and everything. And that and the Jim Mitchum, who's Robert Mitchum's son, was living with me at the time, and uh, we would have packed it out. Come 10 o'clock, there was about four people in the club. Ooh. He came up to us and he said, you guys have been lying. Nobody's here. You're full of shit. And we said, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, there was this ruckus outside and honking horns and all kinds of stuff. And into the club, into the club around 10, 15, came Robert Mitchell, Mitzi Gaynor, a, a whole slew of actors and a lot of people, a lot of fans. The place was so packed. They were over the limits. They, they, were, they could have gotten busted for having too many people in the club. That night, the club made over $7,000 at the bar alone. So we were a big success. And uh, the one night a week there turned into three nights, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, Bob's your uncle, as they say. There's one more thing I'd like you to talk to me about. Uh, you have a very amusing story uh, about Elvis. And, and I think it gives a very nice little indication of Elvis as an ordinary kind of a guy, you know, away from all the glitz and glamour, just the way he used to hang out with his, his buddies. So uh, tell me how you met him and, and uh, how this interesting evening occurred. Well, it wasn't an unusual one because he, I understand that he did a lot of things like this, but 
My uncle was making a film with him. I went on the set at MGM and uh, I got, became very friendly with George Klein, who was Elvis's close buddy. And we really had a lot of things to say. And we had so many things that we were in common with and we became very good friends. And George introduced me to Elvis. And we kind of, you know, laughed about the same things. And, you know, it wasn't like he stuck there and we were talking and he had uh, any great camaraderie, but we were friendly. So a couple of weeks went by and I'd been talking to George and Elvis was still staying at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And uh, I called up and I talked to George on the phone and, uh, I said, uh, listen, my parents are out of town. I think they're, they're in Europe. And uh, I, I think it'd be a good idea. Maybe you guys would like to come up to the house and we'll go somewhere. I got an idea. So they did. They came up. Elvis was driving a Cadillac, a big black Cadillac. And uh, there was George, uh, Elvis, and me. And we got in the car and we drove out to Pacific Palisades. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time by the name of Carol Randall. And she was your typical all-American girl, great looking girl, a model, blonde hair, blue eyes. And she lived right on the, on the cliffs in the Palisades. Yeah. And uh, I said, let me play a trick on her. She's absolutely nuts as everybody was in those days about Elvis. Sure. I said, uh, I've been taking her out. Now, at this time, it was two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Not the time to go visiting somebody. So we drive up, park outside her place, which is out in the street. And very conspicuous because of the big black Cadillac with tinted windows and all the whole routine. Um, so I said, let me get out of the car. I'm going I'm to bring this girl up. So I go down, walk down this slope to her back door. And her window was right near there, and I'm banging on the window. And I said, Carol, Carol. And she's not very happy. She's oh, yeah, you know. And I said, it's me, Steve. I said, come on. I got, I got a surprise for you. You're going to love it. No, call me tomorrow. <coughs> call me tomorrow. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I said, come out now. I won't, you can't tomorrow. It's got to be now. Anyway, she comes out of the place. She's got one of these long shirts on that cover down to halfway down her thighs. I guess she was naked underneath, but that didn't seem to matter. And uh, I said, come on out with me, come to the curb with me. So I take her up to the curb and there's the car. And there's, the, and I, I've already told the guys what I was doing. So as she gets to the car, Elvis who's at the wheel, hits the button, the window comes, kick, 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 And then Elvis looks out and he says, hello, sweetheart. I hear you're a fan. And she went, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't, and passes right out, right there. So now we're worried because it's it's two o'clock in the morning and uh, the car is conspicuous. It's Elvis, especially if anybody gets the wind of that, there'll be turmoil. So uh, George and I get a hold of her. And we get her onto her feet and she said, oh, it's like Elvis, that was a dream. Is that a little bit, you know? And we put her, walk her back to her door, open the door, get her inside and run back to the car and take off. <laughs> she never forgave me for that. Then she wanted to meet Elvis and all that. Of course, that never happened. But that's one of the stories, you know, it's, I mean, these are things that we're like every day. It's like, look, Richard, if people knew the kind of things that we do when we're not working, yes. you know, it's normal for, yeah. for us to do that. It was normal for guys and girls in those days to, to do like everybody else did. You know, nobody said, oh, you're an actor or you're a singer. You can't do that. You must. No, no, no. We were crazy. We did crazy, crazy things. And uh, to me, it was normal. But if you talk about it today, people think, ooh, you know. As you say, Steve, uh, all of this and more is in your great book, which uh, all of the listeners and viewers can see right now on the left-hand side of their screen. But um, I think this is a great time to kind of 
uh, have a pause and wait for part two of this interview because in part two, guys and gals, we will be talking about Steve's incredible career when he moved to first Spain and to do a bunch of films. Uh, and then he moved to London to produce some of the biggest hits of the 60s. But we'll do that all in part two. And uh, meanwhile, Steve, thanks very much. And uh, try to be careful before our next interview. No, no, Richard. I'm thanking you. Are you a long distance truck driver who'll be driving across the country, stopping only at a filthy diner to relieve yourself of the interminable boredom? Great. While you're driving, join me, Richard Niles, for my podcast, Radio Richard. Intriguing interviews and peripatetic performances from master musicians like Randy Brecker, Wayne Shorter, Nile Rogers, and the Yellow Jackets. And even if you don't drive a truck, I can guarantee that Radio Richard will spin your tires. <laughs> don't miss a moment of the fun. Subscribe to Radio Richard. Thank you.